Arkadaşlar ben iz izbir Well, you're not the safe. Get get on time. Get when you can. Plus or minus 30 seconds, Chris. Yeah, well, you know, plus or minus right. 30 seconds. Or These guys are all the time. This is wholly, totally on me. I forgot I'm in a different time zone. Seasonably so. late. Yeah, season, yeah, yeah, so. International <laughs> man of mystery. Doesn't even know what time zone is in. <laughs> This is what happens when you're in Kentucky, so you forget that there's, you know, the rest of the world even exists. So. But tonight, finally, we've got we got somebody on. I've been wanting to get on here. Our first guest. Actually, we have a bunch of first guests, really, tonight. But we got uh, NC Scout himself in the house. Uh, we got Rosin's, or I mean, Emery's better have Rosin sitting in with us tonight. And Carl will be falling down the stairs shortly, I'm sure, to come uh, sit on the couch. <laughs> so he's walking like a gimp, too. Yep. Yeah. Poor, poor Carl. Let's do a shout out to Carl. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so I can't talk too much about it. <laughs> so. 18 oh, Delta yeah. gets a taste of his own medicine. <laughs> <laughs> he was just whining the motor and wasn't working on his knee. I'm like, dude, you realize uh -huh. what I did to you, right? Like, <laughs> Carl was my medic on the team. I'm going to tell him, hey, Carl, does that hurt? Don't do it. <laughs> oh. So a great big, uh, oh. big uh, welcome to Brush Beater in the house tonight, man. And on camera, I was surprised that you said you were going to be on camera. Yeah. I will absolutely be on camera. My my Whitey Morgan t shirt and everything, man. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome, man. Yeah, man. Oh. We so, both here. We did the Green Bray Fourth of July last night, 25 minute fire fireworks show at Carl's house. 26 with, with, minutes and 15 seconds. Excuse me, 26 minutes and 15 seconds. Well, <laughs> it was, it was five grown males running yeah. back and forth, uh, you know, lighting them, lighting that shit as fast as we could. As fast as we yep. could. Yep. Yep. 26 it minutes. Good. It went off. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I got to from being me yourself, tomorrow. Emery. Very anal. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> somebody mute somebody mute this guy that was past that was past 60 seconds we were we were 60 seconds <laughs> yeah, we were we were waiting on that one were we t i bet i was first yeah, I was okay, first. I'm not I was that's not cussing that's not cussing that's a medical term <laughs> yes. this is true it depends on who you ask though if it's a medical term or not because apparently in medicine they can't define some words nowadays <laughs> mm. you know just saying but but Matt, what have you been up to, man? What do you got going on these days? Because you're you're suddenly becoming the, uh, the the proprietor of a serious online concern for selling radio equipment and cool gear that you're developing. And I don't think most folks know what you're up to. Uh -oh. Oh, and they're I, still not I, gonna know. <laughs> and, and you guys have to wait to find out. I think he, that that uh, Freedom now Wi-Fi he's trying to stream off of getting trouble. <clears throat> So, oh, hey, Carl. He's sneaking up. Carl. Oh, there's <laughs> All the right, Carl. I'm back. Yeah. I got so rudely interrupted. <laughs> yeah, there you so go. Rudely interrupted. Uh, so, you what am I up to? Yeah, uh, what do you got going on? Man? I have. I uh, oh. don't uh, interrupt anybody's introduction. Uh, You're good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me, oh, let me, let me, let me, let me say it. Down slow. <laughs> let me say oh, it. Hey, uh, hey, what's up, guys? What's up? Carl, did that hurt? What's up? Did that hurt, Carl? Did that hurt sitting down? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> uh, Remember what you used to tell me on the team? Does that hurt? Don't do it. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't doubt it. Uh, so, what you do? How you doing, Sue? Uh, I'm doing good. Matt, we haven't met in person yet, but uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Sir. Yeah, you two need to meet. It's an honor to be on here with you. It's an absolute and then, uh, frickin' frack up there, Emery and his sidekick. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. 
Lawson, you know you're the uh, the better looking and intelligent part of that dynamic duo right there. Also, it's better than being a rear kick. I'm That's why saying. I'm wearing glasses right now. It looks smart. Uh, it's Matt, I'm sorry, man. I'm 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 really curious to hear what you uh, what you got going on, man. Yeah, come on, go, on, Matt. As well, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Go, go absolutely. ahead. Uh, so uh, launch brushbeater.store, which is uh, I've got a bunch of products up there. I launched a brand new product today in conjunction with Black Hills Design. We had a tool called Ranger Cards, uh, which some folks may or may not have seen out there. But um, through an old Soviet PSO scope, you know, and it had that choke type range finder in there. Super simple, very, very effective, very efficient to use. Um, you know, almost no training time involved in that thing. And I always thought that that was really neat. And some other people thought that that was pretty cool as well. And when you're training uh, designated marksman, you know, somebody that you don't have enough time to put through a formal sniper school, you don't have really have time to teach thing you can put them like this in their hands and going to be effective, right? Um, exactly. my out again? A little I'm bit. A little bit. It's, it's coming out. Okay. Aim it on Elon Musk. It's uh, where I live. I have a storm link. I'm uh, out in the middle of the unis, and it kinda, uh, it's kind of, it's hit or miss when it hits hard or misses. This, yeah, you can hold like, this can hold thing, like, this, you know, on there's no batteries. You can been back and forth. Yeah, you froze up. There he goes. You're in and out, man. It's kind of coming and going. There you go. Now you're moving. All right. Satellite must pass. This is kind of weird. But anyway, um, these tools really, really cool. Uh, when I, I got the first batch in, it made some improvements with this. And what was the adding map tool for this? So, uh, pointers for 125, 1 Yeah, he's cutting out what he's saying, guys. Is he made analog rangefinders. That you kind of hold up, move them yeah. to the person and fits in there, and then analog range finder. They're super cool. I'm going to be doing a bunch for my patrons. They're going to be getting those as a gimme as soon as I can get 100 of them from Matt, <laughs> whenever that is. No, that's super useful. You know, we all hear about about the, the ranging reticles, like, you know, on the ACSS reticles for primary arms. And that's Carl, my good friend, uh, Dimitri, that came up with those and all that. But really, nobody's making stuff that's not attached to a rifle. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, this some is. Of the uh, standards were the old prism ones. Uh, it would, you'd have a split image and you would focus it back and forth until the image was together. They go all the way back to the old uh, German artillery yeah. ones yeah. with the two lenses yeah. that were far apart coming up out of the trench, trench warfare. Those were very accurate range finders back in the day. They were, and you know, they're obsolete now with laser range finders, except they're not. There are times where laser range finders, they just don't work. And it doesn't mean just dead batteries, um, certain types of rain. And, 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 yeah, and it's, like it doesn't. <clears throat> range Re reflection, yeah. are, hard to get a bounce back. Yeah, he, yeah. He, yeah. He How, does yeah. But the, if these mark, cards. These are range finder for 1200 meters. Uh, whatever they say it's good for, rule of thumb for us as actual users, end users, cut it in half. Yeah. So if they say, you know, hey, this is tw it's good for 1,200 meters, good for 1,200 meters for a highly reflective flat steel target <laughs> in an overcast day. But if you're actually out trying to shoot a the side of a furry elk or where is somebody wearing actual camouflage that's designed to break it up, you're you're going you're going to get about 600 meters bounce back, but that's it's good for planning. Just rule of thumb, cut it cut it in half. Whatever they market it for, cut it. That's in the half. cool thing about these analog ones that you've made. Doesn't it's, affect it at all. Doesn't affect it, doesn't at, affect all. it yeah. at all. Lasers are yeah. not the end all be all. So I'm I'm excited. I'd like to pick one of them out. Absolutely, I'll send one out to you. Uh, the, this new model, 
Apple, though, before I started going all robo and having some connectivity issues, this new model has map tools integrated on it as well. So I've got plot corners in the corners for one in 24,000 for UTM, one in 25,000 and one in 50,000. You've also got bullet drop tables as well for 556 and 762 NATO for M80 ball. So what this is, so the, the for everybody that's listening to this and you're like, what the heck are these, these things that you're talking about? Um, I've got one of the mini ones here that I'll hold up to the camera so you can see. You'll see the, uh, the kind of this reverse flute right here on the bottom. You know, so say like at the top, I've got uh, the, the average size of a door up here. Then I have the average height of a man, which is 1.8 meters. Then I have a ranch fence just one meter right here right and so the average height of a man 1.8 meters you know everything is is law of averages here right uh i figure out you know hey the guy is uh he put his feet here on the horizontal line his head comes up to the four right there all right so he's 400 meters away give or take a little bit right because it's all based on the law of averages well if i say all right he's at 400 meters i'm gonna put his head right here or a mass wherever my shot is meant to be right here at the four and then wherever my horizontal line is that's my holdover point so i'm gonna know where all right this is where i need to aim for my point of impact to be where i want it to be all right that's how okay. that works it's very very simple it's a it's a, a basic system very rudimentary system requires no batteries and uh but that this again this is the mini one i have the the or uh, the micro one rather uh is, is the nomenclature on it but it's the small, small one it's the one you can fit in a credit card or, you know holder or whatever uh the the larger one they're they're a little bit larger um but they have a lot more functionality as well but they have those integrated map tools so i went back to uh, black hills design who who is the uh, manufacturer of the uh, really great guy out in South Dakota. And I told him, I said, Hey man, um, this would be really awesome if you integrate app tools on this. that way, you know, thinking, you know, back a lot of schools, a lot of time in the field, especially when I was in Afghanistan, you know, and, um, we've got GPS, we've got daggers, but at that time, that was really when Iran started playing some games with, uh, uh, your, your GPS signals and everything. And we weren't really relying on that as much. And it was like, Hey, you know, map and paper, get back to the basics, start using map and paper again, because GPS is there to confirm what you already know. But you know, we, we need to be relying on the basics here and always carrying around a protractor, which is just mandatory kit, right? That, that is an everyday carry. That is what you always have on you along with a compass, several <coughs> map, physical maps, your GRG and having something like this that had integrated map tools on it to me made much sense. That's the, this oh, yeah. is something that, that we need. This is what the community needs. Um, and he was all about it. We made it happen. And uh, they finally came in, took a little bit of time because I got a huge order. The problem <laughs> I've had on the floor is keeping things in stock. And uh, for anybody in the connections and, you know, Chris, you know, because we talked about yeah. this, um, I never anticipated that the demand for radio equipment would be as high as it is. Uh, the books, the, uh, you know, the, the, I wrote a field manual for the Balfang radio. Um, you know, it, it, it's essentially the gorilla's guide to the Balfang radio. I never intended for it to do uh, what it ended up doing. Um, had, some friends uh, that that said, hey, you know, it'd be really cool if you wrote a field manual for this book or uh, for this radio, rather, because all the books that are written on it are really uh, amateur radio or, you know, kind of they, they're not really written from the perspective of what a ground pounder might need and of course this was about the time that ukraine was really getting hot and heavy and the bow thing has been all over the place um, several other people that that have come from the unconventional warfare community have come to class and you know i've had the opportunity to work with them and you know this, this we, we we have it it's a very simple device but at the same time we want to know how to wring the most amount of capability out of it 
And so I wrote the book from that perspective of kind of certain old school techniques, uh, data bursts for sure. Um, you know, going, going way back to Vietnam using trigram, one time pad encryption, Diana, uh, all of those things and really integrating, um, antenna theory in there where it's relevant. So you know, anybody that's been to Arslick or especially 18 echo course will recognize the antenna designs in there. And I have step-by-step -step instructions on how to build those out of improvised stuff in, in your working environment. Uh, when I have the RTO course, I, you know, the, the equipment that the students get for building antennas all comes from tractor supply. Uh, it's all antenna wire uh, or electric fence wire for antenna wire. Um, yeah. The only things that, that they you know have to source externally, uh, which I provide for them, is is the cobra heads uh, and the antenna connectors for the radios, and you know I, I provide all that, and I'm carrying all that stuff in the store now, uh, along with the radios as well. So you know I've got a, got a lot of stuff. I've got a lot more products <laughs> that are inbound. Um, right now, it's well, it's really yeah. just dealing with the shipping times on it, uh, but. Everything right now, I have everything that you need to build capability at all levels from the uh, what I call the sustainment communications perspective of how do I create communications over an area? Um, just, you know, to, to for, for general purpose communications in lieu of a cell phone to tactic communication, coordinate fire and maneuver. That has a whole different set of considerations. Right. I have that provided as well. And then clandestine. Uh, which clandestine communications, I dive deep into that in the book. Um, but I have everything that you need, all the tools, uh, even a, a one-time pad, pad printer that uh, yep. makes one-time pad Amazing. really, really simple. Awesome. Um, got all of that, got HF radio equipment. I have two different ones uh, that are, uh, and I have a third one that is on the way that should be delivered uh, early next week. We should have that. Uh, nice. So a lot of products, a lot of things to, to be really excited about the store. And uh, I've got a couple more books that are away right now as hey, well. Russ, do we have just finding the time to finish them. Oh, I just want to see if they had the link we put up on the screen for everybody. Because what a lot of oh, folks I, don't realize. Absolutely. Yeah, Matt is, he's got this store and everything, but he's also an instructor. And so sitting here in tonight, you guys have one, two, three, four, five actually instructors sitting in this tonight uh emory and rosin both instruct obviously carl does matt does and so does sue um these guys are i mean a wealth of knowledge sitting in the podcast well yeah i wasn't going to say that much brought up um and it's awesome to have have this, these kind of folks here even though rosin's sitting back there not saying nothing um so, <laughs> Matt, have you tr have you been tracking France and the crap going on there? South Africa. I am. All the, um, shit going. the 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 French Intifada, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of how I interpret it. Uh, yeah, I think it's very it ironic that in 1957 the Algerians fought a war of independence. Uh, the the FLN fought a war of independence and you know the, the battle of algiers which i've told people to read uh, or uh, uh watch rather it's free on youtube you, yeah. you know watch it. It, it it's it's an old film it's black and white it's it's uh you know subtitles but it is a film that is critically important to understand the nature of insurgency and why this occurs you know what motivates an insurgent you know why is it why why do insurgents typically they, they think very different why is it akin to criminal behavior uh, because it absolutely is and and the phases of of revolution the phases of uh of counter-revolution as well i think that, that the film does a particularly good job explaining the missteps that the french algerian police made first and then uh what the french paris the, the critical errors that they made in Algiers proper uh, they arrived after the bombing of the Casbah. What does that have to do with today? Well, and, and not, and not to mention the French foreign legion there, Matt, they, they, they were horrible. In oh, absolutely. What they did now too. Absolutely. What that has to do with today is, is that they have imported France and, and much of Europe can, can speak to this oh, as well. Yeah. They're guilty of it as well. They have imported 
some of the worst segments of those societies into their nations knowing full well the elites of, of their cultures know full well that these these people are not going to integrate they have no desire to do so but they imported them to exploit them for cheap labor and now they're surprised at the result and so we we have we have people who who were already outcasts from the larger society from the larger social order from where they came from this is something that cannot be ignored. They, they were outcasts from where they came from. That's why they left. If they were part of the power structure in any way, shape, or form, they'd have no motivation to leave. But they left. They don't. They they don't go to these new places seeking a better life. That's that's a liberal fantasy. They know a full guy. well life for them where they've life guy. where they've come from is zero sum game. This this is something that liberals can't understand. Zero, it's a zero-sum game where they, they come from. They, they know it's, it's life or death, and they look at it very much the same way. With no desire to acclimate to permanent uh, uh, culture that, that is existing in, in the country in which they move, wherever it is that they go to. Um, and so, that into account, then they're radicalized. They're radicalized because they're disenfranchised. They, they're alienated from the larger country. Uh, culture they're alienated from the people that are there and they they don't they don't have a nation of their own and so now they they become attracted to radical ideology they become radicalized by that radical ideology and they're going to act upon it and this is exactly what we see you know it, it's it, there's not a lot of difference you, you see a, a analog between that and some of the goings on that, that happened a few summers ago you know in the united states here you have to look at it all the same way. And, and why is it that they all end up, when you distill them down, they all behave the same way? This is why. Because it's the sa- It's literally the same thing. When people do not feel like that they're, they're integrated into society, and they're not integrated into society, they're attracted to, to radical ideology, right? And so that's, that's where we are. It, it's not that they're angry because the Algerian kid got shot by the cops, right? In France, that that's not it. That was just the focal point. Okay, that was the focal point. That was what they were attracted to. That was the excuse. The pot was already boiling, right? The pot was already boiling. Matt, what you're saying is so poignant and so accurate. Um, and I've I've been through this a lot of times in the region of the world that that I fought in, right? Um, and you can actually, not only is this all accurate, but you can kind of boil it all down. If you take a, the story of the prophet Muhammad, right? It was the exact same thing, right? When he had to, uh, leave Mecca, right? He fled and and went to Medina, right? Because the, the local leadership there was going to kill him, uh, for essentially taking away their, their source of funding, right? The tourism. And he went and developed this whole thing of, okay, we're the underdogs now in this new city in Medina. We're the underdogs. Mm -hmm. And it is your duty to play ball with everybody there until such time as you have enough uh, strength in numbers to get up and do exactly what you called it, which is intifada. Intifada means an uprising in Arabic. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I, by the way, I fought in what's called the second intifada, the whole thing. Um, and, and it's exactly that process. I'm sorry, I, I, I wanted to cut in and say that, but this oh. is no, so no, on point. Real quick, though, that's, guys, that's I, I want to suggest to Chris that we do a, uh, with all your viewers, have them do a, I, let's do a, like a, uh, you guys do contests? And oh, stuff? yeah, we do giveaways. Stuff, I, yeah. I think we should do a contest, like uh, drawings of Muhammad or something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my channel. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, so we're going to hold off and we're on the mom's channel. It's only the second episode. I'll go first. Third episode. I'll go first. You go first. Yeah. Okay, Brown, put it on your channel. I'll draw it and I'll put my home address on. Come visit. Come visit me. You don't understand how bored my life is. Come visit me. Since 2009. I've killed a motherfucker since 2009. <laughs> 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 
Oh, man, what are you guys drinking there? That's what I want to know. Well, this is, uh, <laughs> what are we this sipping is, on? <laughs> this is Pink Mist. Mid Sue with snipers. This so, is this is Charles <laughs> Red Zen. Red Zen. Red Zen. Made here on the hill. Made right here. And it's freaking amazing, too. It. It's fast. Are you, are you, set, are you marketing awesome. this stuff, too? Is it for sale? It was called, uh, the White Zinfandel was called Helen's Finest, my Aunt Helen. And the guys know Helen. Yep. So it's a red uh, red Zinfandel. We need a different name. What what should it be called? And my my nephew Jamie's like, you and all the guys that you always snipers. So you all should call it pink mist. Pink mist. <laughs> and you know, but the that is awesome. The factor is pretty high. Yeah, the chuckability factor is real high on this stuff. You yeah. can definitely. Ooh, I love it. Turn it turn. Is it? Is it a little fortified. That's great. You know, Matt, the funny thing is, too, and for, for everybody else, because I want to hear Sue's take on this since he does have some French experience. And he has to hurt him for a while. I mean, uh, he went in for a while. Um, and, uh, but it, it reminds me so much when you, when you, they always say that, oh, we're, we're protesting over this killing. But it, immediately it starts out and it's not protesting any variety. It's looting for profit, yeah. generally, is what they're up to. They're just looting yeah. for profit. Looting for um, although in well, they did it here too, but in France, they really went after the state attacking state facilities, burning police stations, schools, schools because that makes total sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah, and uh, they say that the cost about a billion dollars in the protest so far. And third, well, what's what 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 I've seen, Chris, is uh, <clears throat> look what's going on in France and South Africa in the last couple of days, and uh, yeah. Isn't it? Doesn't it look exactly like the George Floyd incident in a uh, different language? Well, the, uh, South Port, Africa looks Portland, Oregon. Oh. Well, I'm gonna shut no. up. On no, I, I I agree with I agree with Matt that the, this all these things have been boiling over for a long time. They're just looking for an incident to basically light the powder keg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Light the fuse oh, on yeah. the powder keg. They're just looking for an incident <clears> to, <throat> to get. South Africa's things. politics are a little more convoluted in, in what's going on there. You know. It's the backlash from apartheid, and, and they obviously, like everything, one side goes too far, then the other side gets their turn, and they go too far. And But I don't know if there's going to be enough pushback in South Africa to right that shit. I know you know some more people over there than I do, but we, we follow a lot of the same guys and talk to them. And what's happening over there to to the, the board is just terrible. I mean, those people are suffering hard. You know, the state, the state energy company, the state power company in South Africa is bankrupt. They can't hardly keep the lights on. You know, so, that's what's run right. rampant. People don't get yeah, it. Run it's rampant. What is you here? It's all kind of home. Mark was Argentina as well. I thought I just saw a hundred percent inflation. Now is what they've hit. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, that's what I was just reading earlier. So uh, they're on the brink of collapse. One hundred percent inflation is what they are currently dealing with, um, and then you tack all these other incidents across the board into it, and uh, yeah, mass chaos throughout. Well, Matt talks a lot about South America because a lot of people don't pay attention to it. The stuff going down there in Brazil and Argentina, Venezuela, Colombia, even um, supposed to be one of our allies. Not so much these days. We're, yeah, we're just losing connection globally. Yeah. Well, I saw that, something that ship is with uh, Brazil and China in bed together as well. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, so, the... go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. So the, the current geopolitical picture, everything south of the Rio, um, going into South Central America, South America. Uh, Fuck. They, they, I don't know, I'm going to tell people to... to uh, Reeling, but listen. I still admit you can find this book for free. Um, it, it it's a quick read, and uh, this is something that, that you definitely need to pay attention to. This is going to give you the long term view of uh, South America, the mood in South America, and really these to why it's right for communist revolution. Um, it, it is a critically important read to understand. It pr it predicted the Cuban Revolution. C. Wright Mills was was um, very very adept at, at doing this because people listen to, to to what people had to say. Uh, sympathetic to to left leaning causes, 
uh, for sure. But you know, it, it important right? What do they tell us? And so in South America, the long-term view, you know, if, if we look at Nicaragua, for example, uh, now, Daniel Ortega, the leader of the Sandinistas, um, came back to power and handled that up. He's a Chinese proxy, plain and simple. Um, Honduras, same way. El Salvador. Uh, the, the leader of the El Salvador government, by the way, is an Iranian guy. Believe it or not, he is the son of an Iranian imam, uh, a, a Shiite imam. Uh, so it's very fascinating now. This kind of gives you another dynamic because the Iranians have a presence not just in Brazil, but in Venezuela as well, in what's known as the tri border region. Uh, Hezbollah has a, a very strong presence there in a camp that is fairly elaborate. They've been working with the, the uh, ELN as well in Colombia. So let's talk about Brazil. So uh, Bolsonaro, who was a very staunch ally of Donald Trump and the United States and American interest, uh, the Biden administration turned their back on him and basically ensured that Lula would be reelected, a man who's every bit as corrupt as Biden. And what did he do? More. He immediately ratified BRICS. He immediately, the day after he was welcomed at the White House by Biden, welcomed an Iranian warship in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, that's pretty, that, that is a slap in the face to American foreign policy. All right. Let's talk about Venezuela. So in 2018, Venezuela had an uprising in Caracas. We were uh, attempting, I say we, the United States was, was deeply involved in it. Uh, the dissident Pol uh, political leader Juan Guaido was welcomed at the um, uh, State of the Union address in 2018. If anyone remembers that, Donald Trump called out the name, and, and he was there. He received a uh, he, the, the uprising, the social flannel shirts uprising, uh, failed ultimately, and you know that solidified Duro's power. Okay. We did the same thing in Cuba. Failed. It only solidified uh, the, the power of Miguel Diaz, who is the, the successor to Petro. Right? So now we're paying a picture of uh, everywhere south of the southern border, going southward into South America, is Chinese aligned. Right, mm -hmm. This is all painting a broader picture. Now let's talk about Colombia. So uh, Gustavo Petro was a communist guerrilla in the 1980s. He was part of a group called M19, right, which later splintered off, uh, joined up with FLN or uh, ELN rather. And they, they kind of were amalgamated in that. He got into politics. He's elected as their new president. Right. Very much similar, uh, very similar platform to Bernie Sanders, uh, radical redistribution of wealth and splitting up a lot of the, the farms and uh, the old uh, impresarios, their social order system. Uh, split, split a lot. And the, the next thing that he did immediately was to call the commanding generals of the military in and begin trust for them. Crimes. Well, this is extremely significant because he said that you are a you are an American puppet. This was his his distinct language. You are an American puppet, and you have been American puppets for the atrocities against the people of Colombia. Was his language? This is very specific, and he immediately normalized relations with China and broke them off with Taiwan. Said we will no longer recognize Taiwan as a sovereign nation. What does that tell you? He also cut off our access to their oil. Now, now Colombia doesn't have a tremendous amount of petroleum reserves, but they they have some every friend that we can get is a good one in the geopolitical space. Well, you know, that's gone. It's it's done. So now when we begin with the broader picture, you know, stuff that Michael Yan is supporting out a lot down in Colombia, uh, or Ma rather of you know all, all of the the camps the people who are being picked up why are they coming in with all their military age males all of chinese along with iranians along with russians by the way 
uh, you know, why? So we have a lot of people coming from South America and Central America, but there's a whole heck of a lot of Chinese as well. Now, another thing, since we're on the topic and we've mentioned Cuba here, the Lord A's Signals Intelligence Station, which was just in the news. This this was just brought up in the news. People were panicking over, oh, it was a Chinese spy station. I did overlays for this on AmericanPartisan.org back in 2018 and said, hey, this is important. It's not important because it's a, it's a quote unquote spy station. All right. The Lord A's Signals Intelligence Station, if you've ever seen GoldenEye, the, the old James Bond movie with uh, Pierre Husband, that was the Lord A signals intelligence station at the end of that. You know, the, the whole satellite that fell on Sean Bean and the whole thing, right? Uh, that was it. So what, what its purpose was, the Soviets built this place to monitor um, the microwave link between Cape Canaveral and Houston because they, they could get a little bit of the, the uh, refraction of that signal coming off of, of its path. Well, that's pretty much obsolete at this point. Uh, they don't really need to monitor that link in that way anymore. It's very significant for another reason, because there is a 4,000 meter long runway that is running north-south. And this thing is just <coughs> east of the um, uh, Jose Mone International Airport, which is in Havana, Cuba, that runs east-west. Why is this thing running north-south and why does it have no other infrastructure anywhere around it? Yeah. Because it's, this is one of six right lanes into, dead ends into the base. It's, I think it's like six lanes and it just dead ends. <laughs> it just dead yeah. ends. Just dead ends. And there's an air uh, traffic control uh, tower right there. Well, if you look to the north of there, there's the signals intelligence station. All right. If you look to the north of that, you have all these motor pools that are staged out there. You have barracks buildings that have been built. And I did a time lapse on this over time. Look, they've been building this. When the Russians said that they shut this down, they didn't really shut it down. It is said that they did, but they kept dumping money into it. The Cubans weren't doing it. They don't have any money. Why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. They're already starving. Why, why would they dump money into a dead-end project like that? Because the Russians were funding it, and then the Chinese did. Because we've turned a blind eye to what's going on in the Caribbean and how the Chinese are literally buying up all the island chains there, right? They have a beachhead in Venezuela and in Cuba, just as we were warned. We were warned in the 1960s, really the well, 19, late 1950s, that if Cuba fell in the revolution, in the Cuban revolution, if Castro came to power, that he, he was going to make this a beachhead for communism in the West. This is what Che Guevara talked about in Guerrilla Warfare. This, this is what the, the whole last portion of the book is talking about, how he's, he's going to bring communist revolution, not just to Latin America, but to the United States as well. In his mind, we were enemy number one, right? And so here they are. They're doing it. So why is the Signals Intelligence Station important? It's not because it's a signal station. It's not because they're training spies there or anything. Even they are. The, the Cuban uh, the Directorate of Intelligence, the GDI, has a uh, center there that, that they use. They call it the uh, um, uh, University of Information Sciences uh, is, is what it's translated to, but but it's there. Um, just to the north of there, you get all these barracks facilities and you have lily pads, right? So you have these lily pads, these interconnected, looks like a honeycomb of concrete. Well, what is this for? Why would you build something like this? Well, if I was manning and fielding the S-400 system, which can also be modified to fire the Iskander M's, which we no longer have a treaty. Uh, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty was was uh, uh, ex allowed to expire under the Trump administration. Well, now they can take small yield nuclear warheads and play them those Iskander M's. They can roll those out, fire them off, and our reactionary gas is almost non-existent. Jump in, Chris. Yeah, Holly, let's, let's try to see if we can get fixed and uh, see if we can get Matt sorted out. Did, did I drop out again? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, you're cutting out again. The reason we're, we're talking about these spots so, around the world, though, and, and the things going on is because people here need to be watching these things and getting ready. Sorry, Carl. For what is. Uh, for that stuff to be to be happening here, um, and and when you look at 
you know, we, we had the summer of 2020, the, you know, the summer of love and fire. Um, and now France is going through. We've been watching South Africa for a lot longer than that. And I right. hope people are paying attention to these things and, and taking it to heart and preparing their families and stuff. You know, everybody thinks that nothing like that will ever happen here. Well, in 2020, it got really close. You know, it yeah. got real violent. And if you lived in Minneapolis or Portland or Seattle or, you know, parts of New York, you had to deal with this stuff. Um, but it's going to be coming for the rest of the country here as well. Maybe not as on high a level, but there will be disruptions. And so being ready to, to deal with power outages and communication outages, and I think that'll be the biggest one. The internet gets affected and, and people can't watch their Netflix or do their TikTok or whatever. That's when they'll start having real problems um, because their life gets interrupted. Yeah. And that's what it takes. It's interrupting somebody's life. And small little things that happen in the city, it ripples down to us. You interrupt supply chain and uh, electricity, cell phone grids, things like that. Uh, yeah, you have a, a uh, what's the medical term? Uh, a metric fuck ton of ammo. <laughs> if you have a metric fuck ton of ammo, you understand that's not helping you feed your family when there's rioting in Baltimore and where I'm at. I'm between. St. Louis, uh, Nashville, and Louisville, and uh, some of those major highways, there are major resupply routes for the entire continental United States. So you interrupt them at an overpass, you get log jam there. It is very hard to rerun tractor trailer truck supply chains around that. And all of a sudden, our pharmacies that only carry 48 hours of meds they're not getting resupplied anymore. The grocery stores with 48 hours of food are no longer getting supplied anymore. And when people make a run on the shelves, those aren't 48 hours anymore. They're three hours. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you either have it or you don't. So um, do I squirrel ammo? No, I don't. I, I, he, <laughs> Pool table. I know exactly where he's looking. I'm right, looking under the pool. Looking under the pool right, because the, the, <laughs> the ammo storage room is full and the workshop is full. And the, but he's not hoarding ammo. But that's for classes and stuff. But but there are other things that you should be prioritizing. And if you ask some of these guys that have been to my place, they'll tell you of everything that I stockpiled. Ammo is a very very small part of it. If it's, you see Emery nodding his head. It's because we, it's we, we may collect a lot, but it's because we shoot Shelf more than we collect. Food than Chris Weatherman has, and that, that's hard to say right there. Well, yeah, Carl, I, you know, all that being said, and obviously, you know, we're, we're all in 100% agreement here. That's something we discuss a lot. I think a, a point that we have to put out to everybody first is, yes, the preparations and all that for case shit happens. Yes, absolutely important, but... I think what there is to be uh, learned from a lot of what Matt was saying is we have to start understand, just open your eyes and start understanding what's going on in other parts of the world. When we here at home, all we think about is how's this going to affect my internet? How's this going to affect my this or that? Cool. Okay. But in order to, to actually understand what's going on, we got to look outside. We got to look at what's going on in Europe in Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, all that, because these things are on repeat throughout history, kind of like Matt was saying. There's a process by which these things happen, and I'm not talking about financial collapse and that kind of thing. I'm talking about exactly what he was saying with these uprisings. Yes, a lot of them come from similar types of societal groups, but really it's happening more and more across more uh, more places, right? And we really have to keep our our finger on the pulse. Right? It's, to me, you work in the, you work in the transportation industry. Uh, is there any kind of chatter inside that industry about supply chain issues right now? I mean, I know for a while we're you know, right, right. I mean, there's still a lot of supply chain issues that we're we're all facing. They call it driver shortage. They call it you know, and and, and a lot of things is a it's a it's a trickle effect that becomes a tidal wave. Right. You know, one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, and it just keeps progressing. So um, 
we do. I mean, as far as supply chain, though, it's 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 gotten better, but there's still big big gaps in it. And if, and just like Matt was was saying about trying to get restocked and 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 stuff like that, you and him were talking about. Um, they're just it's hit and miss. Everything's hit and miss, and it's it's not just one thing in particular. It's fuel prices. It's driver shortages. It's intermodal chassis shortages. Um, one thing that we've seen in the transportation industry here in the past couple of years uh, was the refurbishing of ancient prehistoric intermodal equipment uh, to pull product off the ports because they couldn't get anything fast enough to bring anything in. Um, Gee, so the they're taking shirt? 19. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, remember, we had all the, the issues with the tires in China. So everything is now coming out of uh, Thailand uh for for rubber for a lot of tires um we've we've seen issues with some of the big uh national brand tire companies um not I, I, just the big you know think about the biggest tire companies they are they're having problems finding recaps you know they're running out of tires they're running out of recaps because of of the of the rubber shortage um so it's once again it's it's little it's little things all just keep piling up piling up piling up and now here we are uh, if you thought two years was bad, two years ago was bad, think about when the next one hits, because that was just a trial run, in my in my opinion. That, 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 that's, that, a good, that, that's a good point, too. That's a good COVID, point. COVID uh, was the rehearsal. Yeah. COVID was a rehearsal. Was, you, every was. every yeah. time yeah. I went through Walmart and I had my mask off, you know, I know they were recording my shit right there. Guaranteed. Yeah. Just putting me on the list. But um, that, was a, that was a trial run to see how how bad they could make it. And the next time, um, I fear that it will be way worse. And instead of, you know, people can't get toilet paper for two weeks, uh, it's going to be you won't have any bread and milk and butter and staples for weeks and weeks on end. And a lot or of this could be, yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, a lot of this could be started as well just from from uh, rioting. I mean, I if, if people are burning cars in the middle of interstates and clogging up traffic, I mean, they, you shut down the supply chain right there. We saw it with a lot of the big cities. Well, it doesn't it doesn't even have to be rioting, guys. I mean, uh, you know, uh, T and I live close to each other, but uh, we're right there on I-40. And uh, down in Atlanta, you look at the the routes and you know the roads and the major highways and things. Atlanta gets shut down. The whole eastern seaboard, especially the southeast, does not get resupplied. Oh, yeah. And most recently, I just went out to Phoenix. You know, I did my podcast this 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 podcast from Phoenix last week, and trying to get back home on Friday it was the beginning of a holiday weekend. My flight got canceled three times. I sat in Atlanta. For 12 hours. I called my wife and said, it'd be it'd be faster for you to drive down here and pick me up and bring me home. It's a two, two and a half hour drive from Atlanta. And she said, no, honey, it won't. All the highways are shut down, too. All the highways are packed right, right now because of the, just because of a holiday weekend. Now, imagine that's a holiday weekend. Imagine if it's a national emergency. And if you're now, three, three state lines away from home, you're not getting home. Right. Period. Yeah. No. And, and two, all well, this is also, we haven't even begun to see hijackings yet. Uh, yeah. Like you look at South Africa, they almost can't transport anything by road because it gets hijacked. Uh, they loop the trucks out right. and burn them on the road. Um, and that hasn't really started. I mean, there's a little bit of hijacking here and there, but not on the, there is. On the industrial scale that we'll be looking at. No. And, and it will get a lot worse. Um, you know, these major these major interstates, you know, 95 and the I-21 corridor and I-77, all these that run, I mean, from from north, south, east, west, um, doesn't take much for, you know, just something, just an accident causes all kinds of issues. But, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, look, no, all, all these. I agree with you. That's all. Yeah, I just agree. Yeah, all, all these things we're, oh, okay. we're talking about, though, <laughs> all these, you know, you have to look at. Uh, the, the number of years that we've had, five, six-ish years that we've had of relative quiet <clears throat> from external actors, right? Other, you know, rogue states or or kind of semi-enemy states, terrorist organizations, that kind of thing. All of a sudden, nobody talks about terrorism. All of a sudden, nobody talks about the Middle East. Nobody talks about all these things. You know why? It's because all these things that we're discussing 
are apparent to people from outside of the United States, right? They are obvious to a lot of these other countries, these other terrorist organizations. And they're literally, they're, they're sitting there with their feet up on the desk, eating their popcorn, watching us implode, and just waiting for that little place where they can push that little button, not literal button, right? They're waiting to be able to have that opening to kind of help us in our own destruction and lead to these things that we're talking about, right? Um, and, and we here, we here are oblivious because we're worried about overpaying for Netflix, right? Yes, yep. most definitely. No, that's what it is. Our priorities are, are just way out of check. Um, and we are seeing, I've, I've actually got customers, you know, uh, dealing down on the borders. Uh, Laredo, Texas, for instance, is one of the, the spots that is just horrible. Uh, for a lot, a lot of a lot of different customers, my I've got drivers have told me that they have parked on the border there in Laredo, and uh, he woke up the next morning and tried to start his truck up, and his fuel tanks were gone. They <laughs> they yeah, yeah. took the straps loose and rolled the fuel tanks out from under his truck. Now, I mean, maybe they give him a few bucks too. That'll be, but either way, you know, it's that they, they hijack. Uh, trucks and trailers all the time in that area and uh the more these borders are open the more we'll see that spreading throughout you know the country as well yeah there's a there's a whole new little hot spot that i wanted to bring up tonight and and this one will be mainly for emory and that's that's uh an in over there uh, up in the north because i was tracking that and uh i saw some photos of the mosque over here they had cut the hole to the floor and put that steel door on it and they were that's how they're moving the guys in and out until the idf got in there and they, they put the kibosh on that for them but um that's a whole other thing a small city that's closed down and basically under siege not, not so small then yeah it's, right not so small yeah technically they call call it. a refugee camp it's always refugee exactly. camp. always is always that exactly. in all the news well, are refugee camp yeah. Re yeah refugee camp is a very strategic way to call a lot of these uh cities and towns in both the palestinian territories uh, the Gaza Strip, oh, parts, you know, parts of southern Lebanon, Syria, that kind of thing, and Jordan, um, but mainly the Palestinian territory. So Janine is a place I fought in quite a bit. I've been there, I, I don't know how many dozens of times for, um, and we were talking about it this morning over breakfast, and, you know, there's, I, I, have, I have some fun and funny stories from there. Uh, what was going on now you know, I get I, every time something like this happens, I get you know I get 500 text messages from people. Hey, are you getting drafted to go back? It's like no, dude, this is standard. This happens every couple of years. Um, in the last few years, we've been hearing about it in Gaza. Every couple of years, we go in. There's this big incursion operation, um, depending on the political goals as how they term what that military action is. Um, this Janine Janine is a um, you know if if Paris thinks that they have no good zones outside of their 20th arrondissement or whatever. Um, you know, these, these areas are horrible. They're in what's called the, the A uh, Palestinian ter territories uh, out of A, B and C. Uh, we can get into that some other time, but those are areas that um, the Israeli government and the Israeli military don't really work in as much. They are uh, by definition, they are controlled hundred percent Palestinian authority. Um, and Janine is always at the forefront of, uh, not not in the public eye, but at the forefront of terrorism. Um, it is kind of isolated, not geographically isolated. It's just isolated based on its density uh, and density of terrorist organizations. Um, and so that's kind of the deal. And you know, we forget we don't hear about this here. But in the last uh, in the last year. Really, there has been a tremendous rise in, um, in terror attack in Israel, which we haven't really seen this much terrorism since I was in the military there. And uh, I was, you know, like I said, I was I fought through the whole second five there. It was a bunch of years. It wasn't like a few weeks. And, uh, and and this happens periodically. And now there's a big opening. There's a big, big, big opening. And all of this is more tied to politics than it is um, some sort of physical opportunity. Uh, because, because just like here, guys, if you want to learn what's coming here, you look at Israel, right? And we've been screaming this at the whole world, especially at the U.S., which is our really only true ally, right? Um, you know, minus the whole Biden thing. But um, 
But if you look at what goes on there, you can plan to see a similar thing happen here. It's almost like a, a like a petri dish for what's going to happen here, and uh, and you have to cut it. You have to cut it, and you have to use force uh, because I, I've I've always said one of our problems as Americans when we go to fight a war somewhere else, right? We're we're thousands of miles away, and we we like to say, hey, look, we know. We, we've been studying the culture, we've been studying the people, we've been studying the geography, the language, et cetera, uh, but we don't, right? We don't really understand the culture. Um, and, and by the way, it's a very similar thing in Israel with uh, with us knowing our enemy. Um, I think we know them better than maybe we do here when we go to a place like Iraq or Afghanistan, but, uh, but not thoroughly enough. So the flip side is, not true to a large degree they do understand they do study uh and and they look for political opportunities right now there's political strife in israel both within the government and within the people right it's 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 quite similar to what's going on here the government is up at arms uh the people are up at arms there are uh, in a, in a country of nine million plus minus or plus nine million people over two million of which are israeli arabs not palestinians by definition but israeli arabs right um we have so meaning seven seven million uh israeli you know jews we have half the country against half the country right but we also have well as it's actually not accurate it's, it's four so people in the streets demonstrating against the government which is doing horrible things we can talk about this some other time because we're trying to get to janine but the Arabs there, the Palestinians, they see these things as an opening, right? And all of a sudden, when was the last time we had an actual terrorist uh, attack within the old city of Jerusalem? That's almost unheard of, right? Uh, outside of the wars, I'm talking about a terrorist attack. Um, and there's been like five or six just in the last few weeks, right? So... Running gun battles down. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been, now, this is not Janine. I'm talking about Jerusalem, right? That's <laughs> So, oh, uh, yeah. and the, 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 the random gunfire attack. And the re I want you to go into the Janine thing a little bit. And the reason the reason for that is I think that that's a good parable for Americans to pay attention to. Because again, Americans think that kind of stuff's never going to happen. So I want you to look when Emory describes this, imagine it's an American city that's essentially been been um, surrounded and no one's coming in or out. It's closed down. And you're living in there with that. And then you have the IDF, you know, a lot of people think, is, is the premier military base of this planet. I mean, they're as good as it gets, really. I mean, they're fabulous. And and they're assaulting that city. So it's a it's a very close parable to to any American city that this kind of thing will happen to. So let's give them a little bit about what's happening there and and, and like why. So uh, so essentially uh, this Janine thing, we're only hearing about it in the news now. And that's because there's been a a full scale military engagement there. It's not full scale, really. It's it's um, it's a couple of battalions, but um, uh, and and they're kind of it's like a joint special operations battalion where they take groups of different from different units of, kind of SF like a soft units, uh, put them together in these battalions, and that's who's been doing the majority of the work in the last little bit. But if you look at what's been happening there in the last couple of years. Um, there's been so much stuff coming out of Janine and there's been, um, the, for example, uh, in the Palestinian territories, people, what do people know here, right? They know Hamas. Okay. They know PLO, uh, which is now PA Palestinian authority, uh, used to be Yasser Arafat's group, the PLO, right? Um, a few little you know, anecdotes about the PLO I can tell later. Um, but, uh, they became the actual de facto government. Well, Hamas, terrorist organization understood by the entire planet to be a terrorist organization took over Gaza uh, in 2007 by force from the PA, right? Um, those are the groups people know, but there are dozens of, of actual terrorist organizations. A lot of them are actually more extreme because they are smaller. They're much more aggressive um, because they don't necessarily have political aspirations. They are more aggressive, right? Hamas toned down um, when they took control of Gaza, right? Of course, they murdered all the PA uh, leadership in Gaza. So they're, they're, none of this, none of this is simple. None of this is black and white. The example I want to give 
there's a, a, a <clears throat> group, group called the Lions Den um, that was created, uh, and they started in Janine, uh, Janine, and I believe uh, Nablus, um, also in the northern Palestinian territories. Uh, and this is just in the last couple of years. In the last year, this Lions Den group that started as just a bunch of a bunch of guys, right, with guns, um, and they started growing and growing. <coughs> excuse me, and they they started actually carrying out bigger terrorist attacks. And um, and a lot of this is stemming from Janine. They have more of an opportunity coming from Janine because it is a very hard to get to area. It's, uh, you have to understand uh, guys, uh, you know, those of us who have been in, in Iraq, for example, and all the really dense, dense, dense cities. Um, Matt said a word earlier, he was talking about Kasbah. Kasbah is like the center of a city, right? That is the, uh, we're past 60 seconds, right? That is the clusterfuck of the center of an Arab city, okay? Um, and uh, it, it's it's there. These entire cities are built that way, and the Kasbah is even more so. Um, and these places are incredibly difficult to get to, and that's why uh, so many of the times we have to send in special operations forces as opposed to an infantry force to go get a person, right? Because you have to sneak in there, you have to do these pretty pretty insane things just to get to that place without that guy being gone. Um, and so now it's gotten to just, this is basic three, you know, 30,000 foot level kind of look at it. It's gotten so bad coming from Janine that we had this upscaled thing uh, in that area that hasn't really occurred in the last few years, certainly not in the public eyes of the entire world. Um, and so that's what it is. And uh, last year, we sent in, uh, uh, it's mainly this this unit, Yamam, which is some of our absolute best fighters in the country, um, along with a few other soft units and uh, and just annihilated this group, annihilated them. Um, and, and that's kind of what's happening now. This is not a full scale war, it's not, right? It's just a larger military operation um, that has a very specific, you know, set of people to get and set of objectives that are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're pinpoint. Uh, it's not go in, take over and win the war, right? We've been fighting insurgency wars since the beginning of this war. Um, and, and that's what this is. And so, you know, the fact that we go in and, you know, 13 terrorists have been killed and over a hundred, uh, have been shot and, and taken you know, hospitals, by the way, when, when that happens, typically they go to get care in Israeli hospitals, FYI, um, you know, because we're the horrible people, but, uh, but that's, that's essentially the deal. So it'll probably scare a few of them uh, for a while from committing terrorist acts. What you also have to understand is it's going to encourage a lot, especially of the younger kids to take up arms. Uh, this is not an ending thing, right? And uh, I've had, just to give you an example, I've had quite a few experiences in Janine uh, where, for example, I'll give you one example. We went in, we had a thing for a while that got shut down because, uh, because the EU and the UN um, got pissed at us. What we did was, and this was my unit specifically back in the Second Intifada that did this, anytime a terrorist act was acted upon, whether it reached the border or not, we would go in, figure out where this guy lived. Uh, they would send my unit in, typically under heavy fire, and we'd go and blow this guy's house up. Or, or woman, yeah, as the case in this story in Janine. There's a woman who actually blew herself up in a restaurant in Israel, killed a bunch of people. By women, I mean, she was in her early 20s, mid-20s. And uh, we went in, there were four of us, four people, <laughs> went into Janine. Um, now, under cover of a different military operation run by paratroopers on that kind of the outskirts. Um, and we went in and, and found our way to her house and, and blew that puppy up. And, uh, and it was a tiny house, so we didn't need many backs, so to speak, to carry all the demo. And, uh, and as that happened, a huge <laughs> a riot ensued, which happens all the time, right? That's, that's how that goes down. Um, this is kind of unrelated. It's just a funny anecdote at the end of the story. But uh, what happened was <coughs> all of a, sudden, a ton of people started flooding in the street. And there's four of us 
And I think we took two little paratroopers to, to kind of secure us for a minute while we did the work. And, and everybody was kind of freaking out. Oh my God, what do we do? We can't just start shooting into a crowd randomly. And that's where I grabbed my officer. I was like, Hey, 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 listen, I got an idea. I was like, just try this. Cause one way or another, we're probably screwed. Let's run straight at them and just scream like a bunch of morons. Let's just run at him. I grabbed my AR by the muzzle. <laughs> and we just started running. <laughs> Everything clear. That's, that's called uh, Imris tactics. <laughs> that's right. Never <laughs> um, underestimate the power of crazy when dealing with an adversary. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, I know and, we're running and, a little over, and we are going to, and things are messed up tonight, and I take full responsibility for that. Um, I forgot of a change of time zone. It happens. I was going to ask him, but I, I figured it'd be funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, was gonna ask. I thought about asking a couple times, and I was like, Well, Russ texted me, and he's like, Everybody's in the podcast. And I thought he was telling me, like, tonight. And I was like, Well, yeah, everybody's in the podcast. No, he was telling me, Everybody's. There. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm right there. Right. You know? We had a good dinner, though. We had a good dinner. Yeah, we had a nice yeah, time. We had a good dinner. And we're going to have the little after show, Matt, if you want to hang around for a little bit. That's where we can talk a little yep. beer. Um, but, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I know we're going to stuff tonight, and that's going to be the fault of mine. But, Matt, go ahead and give them a pitch. Tell them where they can find you and your stuff, and then we'll switch over to the after show. Oh, yeah. Patron. Go there and hang out, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brushbeater.store, the link, uh, Holly, wonderful producer uh, that I've been talking to throughout the show. Working He's awesome. Kinky uh, she put the link up, and at Brushbeater.store, there's a special discount code for all of the viewers. It is angry, not angry, but angry, just regular spelling of angry, all caps. All right, it needs to be all caps, very specific. A lot of people email me about <coughs> discount codes. All caps at check five percent off uh, as as a token of appreciation for being here to Chris uh, for being a gallant host and for all of you because this audience uh, the, the audience of Radio Contra which is uh, my podcast uh, that is a great podcast uh, highly recommend it. thank you well you, you've been on there several times so I think you're a little biased uh, but you know. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, but but uh, Radio Contra, you can find it on any of the podcasting platforms. Uh, we're, we're on all of them. Um, have a, a lot of fun. I put up a few episodes per week, everything from, you know, uh, current events to uh, one of the last episodes I did with uh, a friend of mine, the NSA collection guy, uh, who's going to be hosting a class at my place. Um, he's going to be doing a you're, SIGINT course you doing in advance. Again? You hosting on again? <coughs> we'll talk about that one in a bit. <laughs> That's a good. Oh, no, that was an inside joke to him. Uh, no, I know. I know. But yeah, so, go to Patreon and hit the link for the episode. We're going to be on the rock. Go ahead, Matt. Be back. <laughs> All right. Yeah, go ahead. Wake up, America. Don't be woke. I don't think he's getting out. Go I've ahead and shut it down. jump over to the after show. show. And I know it was messed up. Holly, my fault. Carl. Grittier. Carl, my fault. On the rocks with my Angry America. Fall, and the gang is coming up next. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and end this down. And everybody's gone. Or is it just our internet? Is everybody gone? Guitar 